So we have three really cool stories and a very fun question to discuss today. Now the first story is Regina's love interest has more than likely been revealed for 7B and that love interest is Dr. Facilier. And I think it's a really cool idea from a crossover standpoint. However, I'm really wondering from a writing standpoint how they're going to pull this off. Because for one thing, we haven't seen Dr. Facilier since Greenbacks, which means they're going to have to somehow randomly write him back again. Hopefully it'll be seamless. But what I am more, most concerned about is they really hyped up Cinderella and Tiana being best friends. And I kind of see it with Jacinda and Sabine, but I don't see it with Cinderella and Tiana at all. I think it's a very big flaw with the season because, as I said, they were hyped up to be buddies. And I do hope that they can at least pull off this romance. I think, you know, they give special treatment to uh, Hook, Regina, and Rumple. So I do hope that Regina's courtship and eventually hopefully long-standing love with Facilier will be good. Though I do wonder how they're going to redeem him or if he's going to be tricking her, if he's still going to be the bad guy and then kind of pull the rug from under her. I don't hope it's that. I do hope that maybe Facilier gets reformed, but I also love the Shadow Man like as a villain. He's a really fun villain. Princess and the Frog is one of my favorite Disney movies. So yeah, that's the first story. We have Disney villains hooking up, which is really, really fun. So what do you guys think about Regina's new love interest being Dr. Facilier? For some reason, I thought it was going to be Nick. I thought that'd be kind of fun. I mean, he seems, I think the actor that plays him is um more or less Lana Priya's age. So I do wonder, you know, why they decided to go with a villain as opposed to a hero. Because Regina, for all intents and purposes in this season, and many seasons prior, is a hero. So that's the first story. Now the second s story is a combination of an interview and the hint that Madame Leota from the Haunted Mansion is going to be part of the Coven of Eight. Now, I think that's kind of stretching it because, I mean, they did make the Haunted Mansion movie, I think back in 2003 with Eddie Murphy, but that movie wasn't like a financial success for Disney. In fact, I don't think it did well at all with reviews. So I wonder why they're deciding to pull in a character from a ride. I mean, the Pirates of the Caribbean, I think, is a major exception because it is completely based on a ride. It is a ride, and then it made five movies, and it's a billion-dollar franchise. But The Haunted Mansion is not a billion-dollar franchise. So I do wonder why they're deciding to add Madame Leota to this coven. I guess they're kind of running out on canon Disney witches. I would think that they should add Yzma from The Emperor's New Groove and actually make her a witch as opposed to a mad scientist. I believe in the original cut for The Emperor's New Groove, she was like, she was, in fact, a witch who was going to try to blot out the sun because she was afraid of the sun, like, turning her old or something like that. It was a really, it was really, really cool. It's on the, the bonus features for the Emperor's New Group DVD. But point being is, Madame Leota is coming to Season 7, more or less. So what do you guys think about a ride character being added as a new um, character to the show? And to be part of a evil coven because Madame Leota seemed more or less a neutral character. I was just in Disney World um, in November. I went on the Haunted Mansion ride a couple times and Madame Leota, she doesn't seem evil. She just seems trapped and just tells you prophecies. So I wonder how they're going to, you know, manipulate the character from being neutral to being pure evil, if that is the case. Now, along this line, 7B, um, sorry, the second story has two parts. It's an, there's an interview that I found from TV Guide. I figured I'd just read the questions and read the answers and kind of react to them. You guys obviously, you know, can go and skip to the next story, which is about Snow and Charming if you want to. But I thought that some of the questions asked by the TV Guide interviewer were pretty good. So the first question was, and by the way, there are links to all this in the video description. Mother Gothel seems to be pulling all the strings here, but why would she travel to a world without magic? And the answer was from Eddie Kitz's. He goes, I think her motivations are very specific. She is specifically targeting somebody in Hyperion Heights. She's after somebody very specific. That's the same answer. So he's repeating himself, which means he doesn't want to give away anything. What we're going to be doing is building to a showdown in the second half of the series between Mother Gothel and some very powerful people. I imagine the powerful people are Regina and um, Zelina. Now, I said in my trailer review they need more power with magic. Maybe they'll get an alternate version of the Snow Queen. I love the Frozen storyline. We we all know that. Like it's, I piped that up. I talk about Frozen quite a bit in um, these videos or the Frozen storyline. So maybe we can get a version 2 of the Snow Queen. I would be totally okay with that. If they could get someone who's just as good as Elizabeth Mitchell to team up with them, that'd be fun. So, you know, Mother Gothel's motivation is very, very moot. So we don't know anything about it. So I do wonder what it is going to be. And she's the character that I am most interested in for 7B. You know, they they really did pull the rug from under us because we were believing that either that either Drizella or Ivy, or that's the same person, uh, Lady Tremaine or Drizella were the bad guys, like the main bad guys. And it turned out to be Gothel, which is pretty interesting. So the next question is, 
What can you tease about the Coven of Eight and their agenda? And this is from uh, Kitsis as well. Mother Gothel is going to be recruiting the Coven of Eight who are under cursed personas. So a lot of these witches don't realize they were once powerful witches and now they find themselves in everyday jobs. We're going to see, um, we're going to see she's doing that for a reason, but we're excited about, sorry, I'm, I'm very sorry with my uh, reading it. We're going to see she's doing that for a reason, but what we, what we're excited about is there's going to be a major curveball thrown in that the plan is going to be a complication with her and our heroes. It's not just going to be every week she finds a new witch and wakes them up and assembles them and goes towards a dastardly plan. We're really excited. And then from Adam Horowitz, there's another threat that we've just hinted at that's unexpected and is about to enter Hyperion Heights very shortly. I don't know what the threat is. I watched the finale twice. I mean, the only other real threat I see is to Henry's life. I don't see another, like, bad guy threat. So I do like the fact that they're not going to be you know, introducing a new witch every week. Maybe they'll introduce two or three in one episode and then throw in that curveball. So I like that that's, um, you know, coming up in terms of, you know, what we can expect that we're not going to be getting one witch, two witch, three witch, four witch, five witch, six witch. So that's cool. And then they go, well, will we be able to recognize any of these witches? And then Kitsis goes, we'll definitely recognize a few of their names. Absolutely. These witches are from iconic Disney fairy tales or Disney or from iconic fairy tales or Disney lore. Now, one of the Disney lore ones we talked about was the Haunted Mansion. And then I just said it, Yizma. A couple of you guys are saying the Sanderson sisters, but you at least would like to see. There hasn't been anything confirmed about that. Now, the Sanderson sisters are from a TV movie. I don't think that they would do Hocus Pocus. I actually thought about maybe Halloween Town, but then um, the witches on Halloween Town were all good witches. So I don't think they would want to switch um, the Cromwell sisters or Cromwell witches to make them evil. So they are kind of running out of, you know, which characters to use. I believe there's Madame Min from the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Or no, not Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, Sword in the Stone. They could use her. Um, they did use Merlin. So, you know, maybe they can bring um, Excalibur back somehow. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, I actually am very, very um, vested into who these witches could be. I've been thinking about this because beyond Madame Leota, Yzma, and Madame Min, I really can't think of any other witches from Disney canon that they could add. Maybe they could turn, I guess, another character with no magic into magic. But, you know, because Gothel in Rapunzel's fairy tale was in fact a witch. But in the movie, she wasn't a witch. She was just an old lady. So they said they're going to add characters from other fairy tales. So maybe it's just a fairy tale that I don't know about. So the next question is, how long will Zelina slash Kelly be sticking around this season? And then uh, uh, Eddie Kitsis answers this as well. He goes, Kelly's going to be sticking around for a lot for the second half of the season. We're really excited because we're going to see the two sisters partner up and, are, and hero out together, which we've never seen. It's fun to see Ronnie and Zelina together. Um, whether or not it's her happy ending remains to be seen. Her wedding and her fiancé is not very complicated because how do you tell somebody from, who's, from our world that you were once a Wicked Witch, they'll think you're crazy. He didn't really transition. The, there was no second question. He, he just uh, jumped into this. I, uh, then he goes, I think it's very complicated because now that she's awoken, there's a part of her life she doesn't know how to share with this uh, this guy. Uh, personally, I don't really want to see Zelina go through like a, a a very intensive emotional arc with a, with this husband that we haven't met yet or fiance we haven't met yet. I really want to see her, as they said, hero out. I think that would be more interesting. But it, it just adds to her depth and, you know, gives the character more layers. I imagine whoever she picks is just, whoever her husband is, will probably be very accepting of her. Though I do wonder if he knows about Robin. That'd be kind of interesting. Because if Robin's a witch too, then he's going to have a wife to be and a stepdaughter to be that are both very powerful witches. Now, way back uh, in the summer, or I guess May, you know, when they essentially let Rebecca Mater go... Everyone knew that was one of the stupidest things they could do, and now they're super excited to have her back. Now, I do. I, I wonder why they decided. They must have realized they needed her back because of just the the backlash from from losing her, and then with uh, the low ratings. And I mean, Zelina and Regina are just two characters that work together so well. Lana Priya and Rebecca Mater have such amazing um, chemistry, though I do think it's funny he said Ronnie as opposed to Regina because Regina is truly awake. Uh, a couple scenes I really would like to see is also. Uh, Drizella interacting with Zelina because there's there's definitely some interaction there. We need to see what's going what happened in that eight year period when Lucy grew up. So the next question is, what can you tell us about Robin's cursed identity? Uh, Eddie Kitsis answers. Adam Howard, Adam Horowitz didn't answer much of this interview. He goes, uh, Robin's cursed identity is a free spirit, sort of a wandering soul. She is somebody who is experiencing the world with a backpack. So she because she went to Europe. Uh, on her aunt's advice. She had an interesting relationship with her mom. I think we're going to see some real Zelina mother-daughter fun in the second half of the season. 
that's that's a great storyline. I mean, we don't know anything about their relationship, so I think it has to be shown. Uh, one thing with Selena that I personally want to see is her and Henry interact because I just love the idea of an aunt and nephew having some moments on TV because it's never, ever done. Minus, you know, Jon Snow and Daenerys. Okay, so then the next question is, did you know from the start you'd be incorporating this LGBTQ storyline when you created the new version of Alice? And then they go, uh, again, Eddie Kitsis goes, yes, we did. From the beginning of the year, we wanted to do this. We wanted to do for the finale was, well, I'm very sorry. So he goes, yes, we did it from the beginning of the year. We wanted to do it for the finale because we purposely didn't say who cast the curse. So it would be a mystery throughout the first half of the season. And then what we wanted to do for the finale was the time jump. So we see Alice and Robin in love. And from the second half of the season, we're going to see how they met and how they got to that place. Of course, in Seattle, very much like Snow and Jennifer, uh, Snow and Charming. They don't know each other, they don't remember each other, and they don't even realize they were in love. So we're going to see how they met in the fairy tale side, and we're going to be rooting them on the other side in Seattle. That's that's a good storyline. I mean, it's very reminiscent of Snow and Charming, that they literally said that in the answer. So I'm curious how it's going to be uh, played out. Um, you know, when when Alice and Robin were together in the finale, in the finale for 7A, I was like, okay, like I get it. It's they're a couple, but like I don't I wasn't like like super rooting for them right away because I hadn't seen any of this. Like they're just like, yes, root for them. So I think they're definitely doing this LGBTQ LGBTQ storyline much better than they did um, Ruby and Dorothy. All right. So the next question we have, once upon a time has always had a very strong LGBTQ following. So were you guys excited or maybe a little nervous to finally incorporate a, a queer storyline into a major character's art? <clears throat> now this is from um, Adam Horowitz. He seems to take like the more uh, political based questions. We just felt like it, the story. We just felt like this was the story we wanted to tell, and we want the show to reflect the world as it is. We love the story we have with these characters. Of course, they're going to say we love the story with these characters. Why would they ever say a story sucks? Because that's not how you market your own properties. And um, we're having a lot of fun writing them, and we can't wait for the audience to see where that relationship goes. I mean, whatever. It's it's cool. It, it's very cool to see yourself to be to see. Um, more people represented. I mean, Once Upon a Time for 7B, or for Season 7 in general, at least has had major diversity. So I think a lot of people can relate to the show. The one thing the show hasn't had is a stronger, uh, a strong Asian actress or actor besides Mulan. But they also don't have, they also haven't incorporated a lot of Asian mythology into the show. But uh, with 7, you know, Cinderella is Latina, Tiana obviously is African American, and then um, there's an LGBTQ storyline. So the story, the show is very diverse, which is which is very good. I, I think a lot of people can, and the show is for anyone, and I think to see yourself represented in one way or another is really cool. I think one the one thing a lot of people, uh, as the question said, that the show does have a very strong LGBTQ fan base, I think a, a storyline a lot of people would like to see is maybe a gay prince. That, that I think would be interesting. All right, so the next storyline is, is Anastasia officially the Guardian, or is that something we shouldn't be sure of just yet? Okay, obviously, they never give spoilers. That's like the one thing that these, talking to these guys, I've read interviews with them, asking them spoiler questions is just a no-go because they find the weirdest way to avoid it. And and here's your here's, here's that answer. He goes, we're strongly suspecting it is her. That's not a yes or a no. The thing about the Guardian is we also at one point realized it was Alice and she hinted towards Rumpel making some kind of sacrifice so Robin and Alice could be together. So I like to look at, so I would look at the Guardian as a kind of Dalai Lama, which is one person as a new one appears, but right now Anastasia looks like the prime target. Anastasia could just be a witch born magic. It could be Alice. The Guardian storyline, uh, I don't have any investment into because it just, it was in beauty and then like randomly sprinkled. The one problem with 7B that I do, with 7 in general that I have, is there's way too many characters and way too many stories. You kind of just need like, you know, there's six characters and then like two, conge uh, two congenial storylines. There's just way too much. So I do wonder how the Guardian story is going to play out. Hopefully it'll have a good ending. I mean, there's still storylines from the fourth season that are still open. Okay. And then the next question is a follow-up to that. It says, and given that, should we be worried about Rumble passing on the power and dying? Well, Robert Carlyle's contract is up, so I could actually see that happening. Uh, the question, or the answer to the question is, well, I think we should be worried because we realize he's like a vampire who's lived for thousands of years, 300. Uh, he's ready to move on and move away from the power. I think we should also be worried about some people tempting him in return to darkness. In the same respect, he is also a very powerful person in Seattle in a land without magic, and he has lots of enemies. I'd be worried about his past, maybe coming back to thwart him. Robert Carlyle's contract is up. He doesn't want to be on the show anymore. 
they're going to get rid of him in some way or another. He's either going to be reunited with Bell in the land of the dead or Olympus, or he's just, or, or he'll like go off and be happy with maybe Gideon or someone. I mean, who really knows what's going to happen, but I imagine he's going to give up his power and that'll be the end of it. Hopefully it'll be done in a classy, clever way. I mean, I would be very sad to lose Robert Carl. Uh, one thing about the 7A or the 7A finale with uh, Rumpel becoming green again, I thought was kind of interesting, but I wonder if they just did that just to have him go green and scaly. Cause why would he just leave that forest if he was concerned about going gray or, um, crocodile like okay so the next question is about lady tremaine and um Drizella, which i think is a cool question as wicked as she's been i've been secretly rooting not me though i do like Drizella. it's the interview i've been secretly rooting for Ad for Drizella, adelaide kane this whole time so is there hope that she and lady tremaine might one day mend the fence and stop being so villainous all right before i even answer uh, before i read out their response i want to just give my opinion i do not want Drizella and Lady Tremaine to make amends because at this point it doesn't even seem possible. I think what I think they just got to go their separate ways and just kind of let bygones be, be bygones, but not be, but not be buddies. So the answer is uh, from Eddie Kitsis. He goes, I would say this show is about hope. So if the evil queen can change, I think anyone can. Drizella has been our secret weapon this whole time. Well, Adelaide Kane is a fantastic actress. I really have been enjoying Drizella. And uh, in my review, I said, I think Drizella and Henry have more chemistry. I think the actors have more chemistry. Obviously I know that Drizella and Henry are going to be hooking up. But my whole comment about that was, I don't think Don Ramirez and Henry have good chemistry. Or um, Andrew J. West. All right, to keep the answer going, we, purpose, we purposely in the beginning of the year wanted to start with everything thinking, okay, well, Lady Tremaine clearly casts a curse. She's the new Regina, then twist it because we always knew we wanted Rizella to be the villain. Adelaide has just been, Adelaide has just really popped in and that's really exciting to see the audience feel the same way. Is really gratifying because she's doing such a stellar job and we think she's one of the best villains the show has ever had. Adelaide Kane is fantastic. She's a great actress and I'm actually kind of bummed out that she's only on the show uh, as a recurring character. I do wonder if she's going to die very soon. Her magic's gone so her storyline seems to be more or less wrapped up because she's not part of the Coven of the Eight. If anything, she's going to be on the side of her mother to help stop the Coven of the Eight. All right, next story. All right, next question. Even though Henry, um, Andrew J. West, is kissed, didn't wake up Lucy, do you think the fact that he believed the tiniest bit means things are going to be moving in the right direction? Uh, the answer from Kitsis is, I think so. I think when we started out this year, Henry always had the heart of the heart of the truest believer, and he's lost that belief. And one of the moments, in that one moment, he's, wow. In that one moment, his mom says, don't stop believing, you're not cynical. We see Henry starting to believe, or at least wanting to, which is a really important step. But the unfortunate conundrum is when he started to believe, Lucy's belief was gone. Now, uh, I really think Henry is going to just get his happy ending. I mean, I think Andrew J. West is a fantastic actor. Henry as a character is kind of meh uh, overall, but I mean, seven in season seven, he's been fantastic. So I think he'll be fine. That, that's just kind of how I feel about that. Okay, and that was the last question. So um, a good chunk of stuff did come out for, uh, for 7B. It was a lot going on for it. And now the last story about this, this video is very long, by the way. I'm very sorry about this, uh, was about... Snow White and Jennifer, or Snow White and Charming coming back. And the question is, or the answer to it, we remain very, very close with Josh Dallas and Jennifer Gowen. I think they're two of our dearest friends, uh, Eddie Kitts has told TV Guide. I think that the fun thing about Once Upon a Time is people can come in and out even when they're dead. I doubt that means Charming and Snow are dead. Meaning that the world is always open for people to return. Whether it'll be this year or not, we're not sure yet. I definitely think we'll see some familiar faces in the second half of the season. That's interesting foreshadowing as to uh, if we're going to see other characters who we've, who we've seen before. So I do wonder if Jennifer Goodwin and Josh Dallas will come back. I don't think they will. I just don't think they want to act anymore. I think they're really happy just focusing on their family and doing what they're doing. Now, Josh Dallas, uh, he's been super active on his Instagram. He's doing anything but acting. I think he's just really happy living his life. And I think the same thing can apply to his wife, Jennifer Goodwin. I mean, I personally don't want to see Snow and Charming just because I really felt their storyline is done. It was wrapped up. And I like who we're focusing on now. There's no reason to add more characters to add more convolutedness to this. So those are the three stories. So we possibly could see Snow and Charming. We're definitely going to be seeing some new characters who um, we haven't seen in a while, which would be good. Hopefully, um, I don't know who who could who would be, who it would be. I imagine we. I, I feel very strongly we, we could see Maleficent. Maybe the dragon. That'd be kind of cool. I don't think we're going to see Mulan. I think Jamie Chung is too busy on the gifted. And uh, so Regina has a love interest, who's Dr. Facilier. We might be, we're getting lots of new witches, possibly Madame Leota. And, you know, what did you guys think of that interview? I thought it was pretty in-depth, enjoyable. And now we have one question, which I'll, I'll keep the answer uh, relatively short. And it was from a BTM Marine LM. And he asked, or um, 
they asked, what do you think about the Disney Fox deal? They purchased Fox's shares of Hulu. Do you think they'll play into their own streaming service network that will launch in 2019? First off, I think due to the fact that they purchased Fox's shares of Hulu, I think that Disney will totally just turn Hulu into their streaming service, which is awesome. I pay for Hulu. So as long as um, I don't have to pay for us, I think I'm paying for four streaming services. I have Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu. So that's that's three. And I don't, uh, do I pay for HBO? I do pay for HBO. So I have HBO too. So I pay for those four. So I think, you know, in order to, for people, I think for those who pay for Hulu, you know, if they turn Hulu into the streaming service, that would be very smart. And, you know, they're looking out for their fans. I think that's smart. Uh, the Disney company is all about making that money. And I think they also are aware that there are people who probably don't want to pay for a fifth or fourth service. So I think that'd be really cool if they do turn Hulu into the streaming service. There's already a lot of content on Hulu. There's already a lot of uh, Disney-based content on Hulu. And I think they're pulling all their content off on Netflix. So they'll just probably just throw it off on Netflix and put it onto a streaming service. And then they're also making their own original content. Now, in terms of what I think about the deal, I mean, in all honesty, I think it's a fantastic idea. I really felt that Disney was going to eventually buy every company. I mean, they can't do that just because it then creates a major monopoly. In all honesty, the only company I really wanted them to get was the WB, which I think is slightly blasphemous. But because I am such a fan of DC Comics and I'm a fan of many of the WB properties, I think that Disney would be able to really revamp the DC movies and make them just as good as the Marvel movies. Yes, I do think the Marvel movies are better, though I do think the DC characters are more enjoyable and entertaining, except for Thor and Captain America. I've always really been a big fan of Thor and Captain America. So with the Disney Fox deal, they got, I, the only thing they didn't get, I believe, is the news. So Fox will still be doing their news and sports, because Disney can't even keep their own sports network going on, which is ESPN. But I'm really curious uh, what's going to be going on with the MCU, because now the, essentially... Uh, Disney has restored all of uh, Marvel because they have uh, they have the Hulk. They're not going to make any Hulk solo movies anytime soon because they can just put the Hulk wherever they want. And the Hulk storyline could be wrapped up once Phase 4 is done. And then they have that deal with Sony where they can use Spider-Man in essentially any movie they want. And now they have the remaining characters from, um, from Fox, which is the X-Men and the Fantastic Four. I think, if anything, they should let the X-Men settle and then make a Fantastic Four movie, but this is not a whole Marvel-based question. I think the Fox deal is smart in order to just, essentially, they can reunite, they reunite Star Wars, they reunited Marvel, they have the rights to Avatar because they have the Avatar theme park rights, but they don't have the Avatar movie rights, or now they do. The deal hasn't gone 100% through yet. I believe it will go through um, next year at some point. I think the government would do it. Bob Iger it was a possible contender for the president, and I think Donald Trump would rather have Bob Iger running Disney than as a Republican candidate for president because Bob Iger could win. He's very smart. He's very savvy. He's very good with uh, public relations. He's not as crazy as Donald Trump. So I do think um, that, the, that the deal is going to be going through. I think a lot of people are really concerned about like what's going to happen with Family Guy or Deadpool. Um, I think, I don't think Disney would can make a radar movie. So Deadpool could get a little PG-13 or PG-like but I think, I think it'll be fine. I mean, most movies produced by Disney are really good. I mean, there's a couple exceptions, obviously. But I think when you have Kevin Feige, who is essentially a who was the god of the MCU, if he has Deadpool, he'll make Deadpool really good. So I trust him. Um, I, I can't imagine The Simpsons and Family Guy lasting for too much longer, though, because that's just so not the Disney content. And I do also wonder if, you know, they, if they move the, the Fox stuff, to the streaming service as opposed to just airing it on television, will it be like in like a separate adult only content if you have to pay like extra money to have all of the um, the non PG programs? Because you know, kids know how to access streaming services better than most people and they can find that stuff, especially if a parent doesn't want them to watch The Simpsons or Family Guy or a rated R movie. You know, they're not gonna find it. So I do wonder. How, what Disney's going to end up doing with uh, with those properties. I think The Simpsons actually is more geared towards uh, the family-friendly audience. I think The Simpsons is actually more enjoyable than Family Guy because it just has a lighter commentary on things. So I could see The Simpsons going, but I could see Family Guy being canceled very quickly. So I think the Fox still smart. It, it just it reunites a lot of properties and puts them under one roof. I think any property created from this deal will be very well done. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the streaming service is going to be um, or how it's going to, you know, pan out. I'm also looking forward to this DC streaming service as well. So anyway, that is everything. I am really curious what you guys have to say about the viewer question and all the stories. 
and uh, have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll talk to you all real soon. Uh, Snapchat, Instagram, we'll have a, hopefully a couple of videos and photos uh, coming up on Christmas. Like we do a big Christmas celebration at my house, and I'm really looking forward to the holiday. So anyway, guys, I'll talk to you all soon, and uh, share your thoughts in the comments below. All right, bye.